Uh, good afternoon and a very warm welcome to everyone and thank you very much for making your way here through the rain. Um, we have two speakers um, this afternoon, as you know, um, addressing the theme, Engineering a Cooler Planet. Um, the could we part of the talk um, is going to be addressed by Professor Richard Darton, who is co-director of the Oxford Geoengineering Program here at the Oxford Martin School. He is an emeritus professor of engineering science here at Oxford, and until recently was the president of the European Federation of Chemical Engineering, a fellow of the Institution of Chemical Engineers, and of the Royal Academy of Engineering. Um, he's a leading uh, thinker in sustainable development and was rewarded with an OBE uh, for his service to the engineering community, in particular to the chemical engineering. Um, then um, Richard will uh, speak for about 25 minutes and we'll hand straight on to uh, Professor Steve Rayner, who will address the should we part of the question. Um, Steve is another co-director of the Oxford Geoengineering Program here at the school. He is the James Martin Professor of Science in Civilization and director of the Institute for Science, Innovation and Society. Um, he's also uh, a co-director of the Oxford Program for the Future of Cities here at the school and an honorary professor of climate change and society at the University of Copenhagen. Um, sits on many international bodies addressing exactly this interface, science, technology, environment, and society, including the IPCC, the Royal Commission on Environmental Pollution, and the Royal Society's Working Group on Climate Geoengineering. So after they have both spoken, there will be, um, there should be plenty of time for question and answers at that point. So if you could remember all of your questions for Richard uh, during Steve's talk, and um, we will have a good uh, Q&A um, and debate after that. So first I'll hand over to Richard. Thanks very much, Julian. Yes, and I guess if there are any questions at the end, Steve and I will look at each other and say, should we answer this? Could we answer this? <laughs> Next question. Anyway, those of you who have attended the previous lectures in this splendid series of lectures at the Oxford Martin Institute will be well aware of the problems with climate change and the little difficulty we have with burning fossil fuel and making rather a lot of carbon dioxide and what it's doing to the atmosphere and the climate. So I'm going to talk about the possibilities of engineering the climate and one of the ways of doing that of course is to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, the carbon dioxide that we have put there. And here is some technology for doing that. Well, it's not really technology, it's plants. Plants, of course, with photosynthesis take quite a lot of carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, at any rate temporarily, <coughs> because they have their own life cycle and the carbon cycle eventually returns most of that carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. But just as an indication of the magnitude of the problem that we're facing, because engineers are quite good with numbers, we like to put numbers on things if we can. Let's just think about this. Human activity is putting about 80 million tons a day of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. 80 million tons. That's all of us on the planet. Most of it through burning fossil fuel. Uh, some through land use change, so we're cutting down and burning forests, changing the type of uh, plant growth, <coughs> which is a net producer of CO2. I'm going to be speaking for about 25 minutes, and in that time, humans will have put about a million tonnes of CO2 into the atmosphere. So when I sit down in about <coughs> 20, 20 minutes' time, another million tons will have gone up there. In that period, plant life on Earth will have photosynthesized about 15 million tons. It's about 15 times as much as we're putting up there. So we're putting up about 6% of the naturally occurring flow between the atmosphere and all plant life on Earth, which is kind of an indication to me that it is really rather surprising that we still have people around who deny that human intervention is causing climate change. Because we're interfering in the natural flows to this extent. 6% may not sound like much, but if you're filling up a bath and what's going out of the plug hole is just in equilibrium with what's coming in, 
and you open the tap to put another 6% in, you will see that level rise, won't you? And before long, if you don't do anything, the chances are it'll be over the edge of the bar. Well, that's what we're doing, of course, with the atmosphere. So we'll come back to uh, plant growth again a little later in this talk. The need to do something. This is a, quite a well-known slide. It's a modeling slide, and it shows the black line, the heavy black line. Uh, initially, we'll show you the actual way that CO2 concentrations are changing. And this is a forward look on the basis of more or less business as usual. And it shows you what happens to atmospheric CO2 levels in the model if human uh, emissions of CO2 are stopped. You can do this in the model, of course. A bit more difficult to do with actual human society, but at three points in the future. Uh, 2012, which is when the modeling was done, 2050 and 2100, and you can see that the model predicts a very slow rate of decrease, and that's because basically the atmosphere is in equilibrium in terms of natural processes putting CO2 up and drawing CO2 down. And we've disturbed that equilibrium, and it will only come back very, very slowly. And the longer we leave it to take action, of course, the higher the level, and the more future generations will have to deal with this particular problem. Hence, the need to do something. I quite like this slide as it illustrates the nature of the problem. Here, over rather a large time scale, going back to 1850, we can see the growth of uh, CO2 emissions, which have had little ups and downs. Um, this is a, a picture from The Guardian, so let's hope they got it right, but, I mean, it is roughly right. And you can see, for example, the Great Depression, which intro introduced a, a slight blip downwards, post-war boom, the 1950s and 60s, where things grew rather more rapidly than usual. A couple of oil crises that turned things down a bit. And this dotted line on the right-hand side is what we would need to see emissions turn into if we're going to pretty surely avoid exceeding two degrees Celsius, which is sometimes talked about the level that we would need to avoid what's called dangerous climate change, whatever that means, but it's a kind of yardstick. So if we want to keep things not too bad, and two degrees already introduces quite a number of challenges, then we should turn around more or less straight away. Now, of course, that's not very likely to happen, but this sketches the nature of the challenge. Decarbonisation is really what we need, but if, if we don't have it, if we can't do that, could we engineer the climate to make up for the fact that we're not decreasing carbon dioxide emissions as fast as we should? So these slides really kind of set the scene and kind of set, illustrate the dynamic and the priority of why are people like Steve and I actually considering engineering the climate? It, it sounds quite balmy. Why are we doing it? Well, there's a need at any rate to think about it. So geoengineering is not in the title of the talk, but that's what we're talking about. The deliberate large-scale intervention in the Earth's natural systems to moderate global warming. And it comes basically in two flavors, although there are sub-flavors of these flavors. You know, it's like a box of black magic. You can think about it. You know, you've got the hard centers and the soft centers, but within that, you've got lots of different flavors, and geoengineering is rather the same. But the two main physical principles that are proposed, solar radiation management, in which we reflect back a small amount of the radiation that the sun is, well, on most days, giving us. Even today, actually, is quite a bit of radiation. And you don't need to reflect that very much. At the top of the atmosphere, this, what's called insulation, the amount of radiation hitting the outer atmosphere, is about a kilowatt per square meter. And you only need to reflect back a few watts 
per square meter. So a few watts divided by a kilowatt is less than 1%. It's a fraction of 1%. So that's actually quite a tempting target for scientists to think, well, it's not very much, so perhaps we could reflect back that little bit, just enough to change the radiation heat balance, and the planet would gradually cool down. So that's an interesting target. Of course, the challenge is, how do you do that? And we'll talk a little bit about that. The other way of tackling this, major way, is to draw down carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. The major difference between these two technologies in their effect is that solar radiation management could take effect relatively quickly. That's to say that the cooling effect would be noticeable within some months or in at least some years, a few years. Whereas drawing down CO2, it would take a long time, many years of drawing down before the climate was, was being affected probably at all. It would also be quite difficult to see if you were affecting the climate, but that's another matter. So this is a kind of general slide showing you some of the technologies that have been suggested. Starting on the left-hand side there, you've got the sun in the, in the sky. One way you could do this, for example, is to sail ships around at sea. Generally, the idea is to squirt seawater into the atmosphere a few hundred meters, not much more than that. If you get the drop size right, then you make clouds. The clouds reflect radiation back into space. If you have enough ships going around, and you don't need that many, you can create more white clouds, change that radiation budget just a little bit, and off you go. <coughs> cool the planet. That's a, an SRM, it's a, radiation uh, a radiation management technique. Um, you could fertilize the ocean. There are two suggestions, either where the ocean is short of phosphorus or iron, and you could cause an algal bloom, for example, which would cause a uh, drawdown of CO2 to grow um, algae in, in the ocean. Huge amounts of algae, if you're lucky, that will then, if you're also lucky, fortunate, will drop to the bottom of the ocean, hence you're taking CO2 out of the atmosphere, that's been suggested. Here we're talking about, this thing here is not a huge fly swat, although it looks a bit like it, is somebody's artistic impression of a carbon dioxide uh, trapping column with some sort of chemical in it. And you could do that, certainly. Compress up the CO2 carbon dioxide in, a, in some sort of compressor station and pump it down a hole in the ground. Keep it out of the way for some hundreds, if not thousands of years. You could do that. You could grow a lot more trees or some other types of biomass which would also draw down CO2. This one is quite an interesting one and being taken quite seriously. This is um, injecting aerosols into the stratosphere uh, at over 20,000 meters, over 20 kilometers. And if you have, uh, for example, sulfur aerosols, these will then reflect at the right particle size, they'll reflect radiation back into space. This mimics what is known to occur during uh, volcanic eruptions, where it's known that aerosols in the upper atmosphere have in fact caused cooling of the planet. So this is kind of an artificial uh, sulfur aerosol mimicking a volcano. The problem, of course, is that you've got to get aerosols up into that level of the stratosphere. Or coming back down to Earth again, there have been suggestions to paint buildings white, or roads, or desert areas, um, and reflect radiation that way. So there's a whole range of different techniques that have been suggested. Stephen Salter at the University of Edinburgh has, together with a, a colleague, Professor Latham, have come up with this idea, here are some of uh, Salter's cloud ships. We do know that this 
could work. I mean, if you take pictures of um, sea lanes from space, you can see the ships traveling across the sea with plumes above them of cloud. These would be kind of sailing around, according to Stephen Salter, 1,500 unmanned ships buzzing around in the right uh, latitudes would do the business. 3.7 watts per square meter would be sufficient to drop the temperature by a degree or two. Rather a, rather a neat idea. 1,500 unmanned ships doesn't sound a huge number when you think of the magnitude of the problem we're talking about. So other SRM proposals I already mentioned, the sulfur aerosols, they are being taken seriously. There's been some engineering um, investigations of whether that would be possible. The uh, second idea here, which is kind of portrayed in this uh, picture of putting ref reflectors into space is not being taken terribly seriously, although it has been proposed. It would be a huge um, logistic problem to actually transport the reflecting material and get it in the right place in space and keep it there. We did some calculations on this and you'd need an absolutely enormous space industry putting shuttles up and down um, for quite a long time to get the reflecting material up there. It's, it's quite an undertaking. This last one is, is quite a nice one, kind of somebody dreamt this one up, I don't know who. Cover 10 million square kilometers of desert with reflective sheeting, which kind of sounds attractive if you don't happen to be one of the people who lives in or near the desert. So mostly the people suggesting this are people who live a long way away from any of the deserts that would be concerned. We, we, we do know that large areas of greenhouse cause cooling locally with the reflection into space, and this would just be, you could consider it as an extremely large greenhouse. You might indeed be able to grow crops in here, as well as reflecting light into space, and that would be an, an added benefit. But to be honest, we don't know too much about any of these ideas, about how they would work. And one of the problems, if you're working in this area, is this whole problem about unknowns and unknown unknowns, because it's quite difficult to get support for research funding in this area. If you think about it, most governments don't want to know, because geoengineering is, is fairly controversial. Um, the British government has as a policy that they are going to meet the two degree target. So the British government's not interested because it's not government policy. That was what we were told anyway. Um, if you go to the research councils, if you're an engineer, they want to know what's in it for British industry. And when you say, well, we're not actually developing things that you can use because we think industry is a good idea, but just that we ought to know whether it's possible to save the climate in this way, Again, it's, it's not an attractive uh, proposition. So there's not much research going on. So there are a lot of questions. On the side of feasible technology and understandable technology, I, as a chemical engineer, kind of relate to this type of process much more readily than some of the mirrors and solar radiation technologies. This is a chemical plant. Um, this, is being, this particular process is being developed by David Keith, who was at the University of Calgary and is now at Harvard. And his idea is to use caustic soda, sodium hydroxide, which of course is a good adsorbent, absorbent for carbon dioxide. Um, one of the most straightforward ways for any of us to do our bit to draw down CO2 is to get our children, if they're still at school, to go around taking all the stoppers out of the bottles of sodium hydroxide in the lab, because that will draw down CO2. You get a nice crust of CO2 around the, um, the neck of the bottle. You won't be very popular with the lab technicians, of course, if you do this, but it will draw down a small amount, and that's what this absorber on the right-hand side is doing. The caustic soda will take CO2 out of the atmosphere, 
The problem is that you can't then just dump the caustic soda because you would get through a huge amount of caustic soda and what would you do with it? So you have to reclaim it and recycle it. And the problem is that caustic soda will turn into sodium carbonate and turning that back into uh, caustic soda takes a lot of energy. On this side, this particular process has a kiln working at 900 degrees. And for a chemical engineer, this is already a warning flag because anything that has a temperature swing between atmospheric and 900 degrees is going to have a huge energy penalty in terms of heat recovery. So David is still developing this process, but uh, it, you know, I think it's, it's workable. Of, of course, the chemistry is fine, but in terms of practicality, there are some, some challenges, let's put it that way. If you think about the world in which such chemical methods might be deployed, you immediately have to start thinking about a world in which we are probably still burning a lot of fossil fuel, producing a lot of CO2, which is going up a flue gas stack. So drawing CO2 down out of the atmosphere, once it's become very diluted, is in engineering terms much less attractive than attacking the CO2 in a chimney stack where the concentration is probably 300 times, 400, 500 times as high. It's much easier to take the CO2 out from a concentrated gas than from a dilute gas in terms of energy. Now, now it's not quite so difficult as you might think because we know where the big polluters are. The International Energy Agency keeps tabs on power stations and also cement works, and these are by far the biggest single source, what we call stationary source polluters. In fact, about 50% of all CO2 emissions come from these sources, of which there are only about 8,000 on the planet and we know where they are. So we could do flue gas treating, and if we did that for all of these, we'd save about 15 billion tons a year. Now, I don't underestimate the difficulty in doing that, because 15 billion tons of CO2 is still a lot. So that's a lot of investment, and you've got to think of something to do with it. There is no chemical route for this on Earth, there's nothing else that we need in, in such large terms except possibly food. You could turn this CO2 into food, but you would need a heck of a lot of greenhouses to do that. Probably most of it would end up being stored underground, and underground storage of CO2, we know how to do that, but at the moment there is virtually none being done anywhere on the planet. So this would be a huge new industry as indeed it would be if we did CO2 removal from the air. That would also need a huge new industry. Because if you think about it, we'd be reverse engineering the combined oil, gas, and coal industries. And they are quite big industries. In fact, the biggest on the planet. So CO2 capture from uh, the atmosphere is only kind of envisaged if you're thinking at the same time as uh, CO2 capture from flue gas. And here's the, I'm sorry, this is rather a technical slide. This is, the, the, this is a challenge, you see. Air capture is quite profligate in energy, taking CO2 out of the atmosphere. And it needs at least two and a half kilowatt thermal per kilogram of CO2 captured. But we are currently running lignite power stations all over the place, particularly in Eastern Europe, which is only producing two kilowatts thermal per kilogram CO2 released. So instead of using energy to draw CO2 out of the atmosphere, it would be much preferable to use the same energy to shut down these power stations. We would save more CO2 simply by using a higher grade energy, for example, natural gas. So it's very difficult 
for air capture to compete in terms of energy with alternative uses for that energy, particularly if you're using renewable energy. If, you, if you've got a good source of renewable energy, you could shut down all these power stations, use the renewable energy, photovoltaics or wind energy or whatever, and that would be a much better way of taking CO2 out of the atmosphere than, than capturing it. So, just very briefly, I mentioned fert ocean fertilization already. Planting more trees sounds like a great idea to me. You'd need another roughly 100 million people to work in forestry. That would be fun. Biochar is another idea that's been proposed, turning wood into charcoal, burying it in soil. Again, a very good idea, but difficult to scale to the size that we'd need of billions of tons a year. Enhanced weathering, drawing CO2 down and combining it with alkaline minerals. It happens anyway. There are quite a lot of alkaline minerals around the place that do draw down CO2, but they only work rather slowly. That's why that earlier slide of carbon dioxide concentration sh showed you if we stopped emitting, they would drop rather slowly, and that's because naturally occurring deposits of adsorbent only work rather slowly. But perhaps we could engineer them to work quicker. Who knows? Again, we need some more work done on that. So this is my last slide. They're not conclusions. They're an introduction, firstly, to my colleague. But here are some questions. Will these ideas work? Well, some of them, to be honest, are pretty far-fetched, and I would give their chances of ever seeing the light of day as pretty small. But there are certainly ideas here which could work. Um, sulfur aerosols, we know there's an existence proof in terms of volcanoes. Cloud whitening, we'd need to be able to engineer the ships and the injectors, but that would, that would certainly work. Uh, chemical treatment of the atmosphere is certainly possible. We know how to take CO2 out of the atmosphere. Just think of the stopper and the caustic soda, so we can do it. Which is the best? I don't know. You'd need to do a triple bottom line assessment or think about your criteria. There are other things you'd need to think about, applying these things on very large scale. What about the undesirable side effects? Because you might, if you go for a global change in temperature, change the temperature, but you might also totally change rainfall patterns on the surface of the Earth, for example, by changing the monsoon seasons. So there would be winners and losers. So how are we going to deal with that? Who's going to pay for all this? Because assuredly, if we try and engineer the climate, it's going to cost something. Who's going to pay? Who's going to control it? Who's going to have a finger on the button? What about democratic control? Do we need that? What will happen if we decide it's not a good idea and turn off whatever it is? And let's remember, at the moment, it's hardly possible to engineer the weather, let alone the climate. Uh, is there some better way? And I, had, I couldn't resist myself. I couldn't leave this as an open question. Yes, there is. We have to stop burning so much blooming fossil fuel. I'm not going to tell you how we can do that, I would, you know, if I knew. But th this is the far more obvious way to get out of the difficulties. But it's difficult. And then finally, which I think we may hear more about in the next half hour, what about the social, moral, ethical issues? Because there are some. And at that point, I will leave my colleague to answer the really difficult question. Thank you, Richard. Um, this is not seamless, apparently. I understood that these had been joined up. But. That's what happens when you let engineers meddle with stuff. Thank you. I got it very excited in my hardware store the other day because I thought somebody had already come up with an off-the-shelf
carbon removal technology. It was a bit disappointing when on closer examination I discovered it was just an oven cleaning product. Um, but there we go. Richard offered you a definition of uh, climate geoengineering. That was, in fact, a definition that was originated by the authors of this document, of which I was one. Uh, the Royal Society's report, Geoengineering the Climate, which came out in 2009. Uh, and in addition to defining climate geoengineering, it concluded that the acceptability of any of these kinds of technologies that Richard has already introduced to you will be determined as much by social, legal, and political issues as by scientific and technical factors. And for the Royal Society to draw a conclusion of that sort, normally a body that only addresses itself to strictly scientific and technical issues, uh, was itself, uh, I think, a very significant event. But the working group went on to recommend the, the development and implementation of governance frameworks to guide both the research and development and any possible deployment. So here was a case where the scientific establishment was actually advocating, putting in place governance arrangements for the develop research into the development of a technology before that technology had even got off the drawing board. And that itself was also uh, another quite remarkable uh, event. It was in response to that recommendation uh, that colleagues uh, here at Oxford, along with some of our friends and colleagues at Sussex and University College London, uh, put together a proposal to the Economic and Social Research Council and the Arts and Humanities Research Council <laughs> precisely to explore the implications of a wide range of geoengineering approaches. And I want to emphasize this was not to promote or advocate any of them, but to understand what the social, political, ethical implications of these technologies would be and what kinds of challenges they would represent to national and global governance. And specifically, we ordered our proposal around these four themes that you can see here, identifying the framings of geoengineering, how geoengineering is being proposed, how it's being understood, to explain and enlarge upon what were the dilemmas of control that would face any regulator uh, of research and development, let alone implementation, to explore governance and regulatory requirements that the regulators might come up with, and also, at the same time as doing this, to stimulate dialogue, to have a wider social conversation beyond the technical community, beyond the social science community, uh, indeed bringing in the public, policy makers, and trying to do so on an international scale. I'll just briefly revisit something that Richard has already uh, gone into in some detail. He explained the distinction, which is largely an engineering and physical science distinction, uh, between the carbon dioxide removal and the solar radiation management technologies. But implicit in what he presented, but less uh, obvious, was a distinction between approaches by which you are in essentially enhancing natural earth systems processes, in the case of iron fertilization, adding nutrients to the ocean to encourage algal blooms, in the case of sulfate aerosols, in putting those aerosols into the stratosphere in imitation of volcanoes, and on the other hand, of more traditionally, if you like, black box engineering solutions. Uh, and you saw that sort of strange thing which Richard pointed to and said it wasn't a tennis racket or something of that sort. This is another version uh, of what a carbon dioxide collecting machine would be, another version of a, uh, a solar mirror. And the point that I want, the reason why I'm trying to draw out this other distinction is the, because of the observation that from a social and policy making point of view, Actually, it's probably the Earth systems enhancement kinds of approaches that are going to be more difficult uh, to come to grips with, both in terms of social acceptability and also in terms of regulation, not least because of the implications of irreversibility in these cases, uh, whereas, at least in principle, switching off a machine or taking a piece of equipment out of service should be relatively straightly straightforward. It may actually not be as easy as that, because, of course, if you have developed these engineering approaches, you've also created a huge industry which has a vested interest in keeping them going. So though, in principle, they seem to be more reversible than the Earth Systems uh, Enhancement, or if you don't like it, Earth Systems Tinkering uh, approaches, uh, in fact, in social terms and political economic terms, they may not turn out to be so. We start with the whole question of how 
these technologies are being framed, and the first thing I want to point out, a little bit of so social science jargon here, is that they represent very heterogeneous technical processes which are being gathered together under a single umbrella term, geoengineering. What I mean by heterogeneous technical processes has already been illustrated by Richard. It's a whole variety of bits of science and bits of uh, engineering technology uh, that almost have nothing in common with each other. The kinds of socio-technical practices involved in putting sulfur aerosols into the stratosphere are entirely different from those that are involved in making, uh, say, carbon-sucking machines uh, on the ground. In that respect, it's actually rather similar to the situation that we faced with nanotechnology uh, over a decade ago. If you think about it for a moment, nanotechnology was also a set of heterogeneous technical practices, ranging from things like electronic miniaturization uh, through to colloidal chemistry, uh, which were brought together under an umbrella term of the very small, and under geoengineering, we're bringing together equally heterogeneous things under the umbrella term of something that's very big. The other bit of jargon up here is this term socio-technical imaginary. That's another social science term. What it essentially means is these things don't exist yet. They're basically ideas. Uh, some of the bits of kit that are involved do exist, but it's thinking about how to put these bits and pieces together in novel ways that have not yet been tried. So we're still dealing with a highly underdeveloped area of science here. We don't have anything remotely resembling a socio-technical system that is capable of delivering the kinds of outputs that geoengineering technologists uh, hold out the promise that we could eventually uh, have from them. And we've seen around the emergence of uh, this field of uh, science and technology uh, an interesting definitional politics evolving uh, we have seen attempts to reframe carbon dioxide removal simply as climate mitigation, particularly on the part of its advocates who don't want to be associated with the big scary thing about solar radiation management. Uh, so we've actually uh, also seen attempts to redefine solar radiation management uh, in a recent US National Research Council report uh, as albedo modification, the much friendlier idea of painting your roof white. Uh, or going for white road surfaces. At the Asilomar conference on geoengineering in 2010, it was very interesting to notice that people who were involved in forestry were busily trying to define themselves out of geoengineering. They didn't want to run the risk of being subjected to further regulatory constraints beyond those which they already were laboring under. But on the other hand, the biochar people Richard mentioned this technology briefly, were actually wanting to be counted as geoengineering because they thought this was a way that they might actually get some funding support to develop their technology uh, and some exposure for a technology which is not currently widely understood or recognized. So we performed a, what we call framing analysis. We did three kinds of framing analysis. One was actually looking at how experts of various sorts, people who at least claim some kind of expertise in the geoengineering field, uh, defined the issues, and that revealed a highly divergent range of opinions. So within the communities of people who are talking about geoengineering, thinking about it, thinking about design, thinking about the regulatory constraints and so on and so forth, we have very different ideas about what geoengineering is and what it could offer. I'm not going to go into them in detail because we would be here for quite some time. We also performed a Wikipedia analysis which showed that, in fact, the kinds of discourses on, on the web that are going on around geoengineering shows that it's quite disconnected from the mainstream discourses about mitigation and adaptation. And that in itself is also a, a significant thing for us to think about as to what are the implications of thinking about geoengineering separately from thinking about the broader range of socio-technical options that are available for dealing with climate change and as Richard alluded to in his last slide, slide, there's the whole issue of decarbonization. We also performed uh, some deliberative mapping, uh, which is illustrated here. It was done by Rob Bellamy, who's in the audience and uh, gave one of the talks earlier in this series last term. And that highlighted really the importance uh, of uh, relocating this discourse back in the mitigation and adaptation discourse, as well as the importance 
of avoiding premature closure on geoengineering debates. And what this work also showed, importantly, was that lay people with relatively little technical information about the technologies were actually able to deliberate about them and, and debate about them in intelligent and sensible ways. A few other thoughts on framing, uh, particularly uh, early in the period immediately following the Royal Society Working Group report, uh, there was a lot of talk about geoengineering as a response, something we might need in a climatic emergency, or as a plan B. And both of these framings have proven to be highly controversial. The problem of with the climatic emergency framing uh, is both social, uh, political, and scientific. Uh, social scientists worry about the idea of declarations of states of emergency. Who is it who decides that you've got an emergency? When is a certain set of circumstances sufficient to declare an emergency? Who declares it? And what happens when you declare emergencies is usually the suspension of normal rules of social behavior and governance uh, because it's an emergency uh, and therefore there are serious implications there uh, for the maintenance of democracy. Um, there's also the question of how would you decide on a global scale uh, when we have 192 countries that can't even agree over emissions reductions uh, to agree about putting sulfate aerosols uh, in the, to the stratosphere. It's also impractical because by the time one knew one was in a climatic emergency, uh, that you reach some kind of tipping, imminent tipping point, uh, it would actually be too late for any of these technologies uh, to have a significant effect uh, to reverse that course of action. The Plan B framing, which, by the way, was not used in the Royal Society report, but was only used in the preface uh, by uh, Lord Rees, the pr then president of the Royal Society, has also caused confusion, not least because for some people, Plan B is something that you do when you've given up on Plan A. So the implication that you've got a Plan B is that you've given up on mitigation and adaptation and you're going to Plan B. Uh, whereas for others, plan B merely means it's an additional or supplementary measure. And confusion over that has led to those framings falling out of favor. We did some considerable analysis on costs of financing, and one of the things that was a very robust finding reinforced that conclusion that we had already reached on the Royal Society Working Group, that all of the cost estimates that you see for any of these technologies are heavily overdetermined by the input assumptions. What that means is, in fact, that the inputs are the outputs, or the outputs are the inputs. Uh, if you want to make any of these technologies seem expensive, you simply make a selection of input assumptions that will lead to that conclusion. If you want to make any of them look attractive economically, uh, similarly, you choose available inputs that will make it look attractive. So the, the lesson here is even when you see a uh, piece of economic analysis which has several pages of closely written formulae and calculations of costs around geoengineering, none of it makes any difference. Just go back and look at the input assumptions. Secondly, almost all of the analyses that are performed don't include environmental externalities. They simply look at the project costs. What's it going to cost to build this thing and put it in place? Um, and, of course, when you just look at the project costs, in fact, the sulfate aerosol uh, technology actually looks quite attractive. Uh, although you would need quite a few planes to get a, the sulfate aerosols up there and keep them up there uh, over an extended period, relative to the cost of conventional mitigation, the project costs look cheap. But if you think about the kind of eventuality that might occur, and Richard mentioned one uh, in his talk, uh, some modeling has indicated that you might have serious disruption of the Asian monsoon with effects on Asian agriculture, um, you can imagine just how high uh, the costs might be of that technology uh, if you count those kinds of externalities in. So that's another thing to think very carefully about. Generally speaking, we also observe that cost estimates for any major project, doesn't matter what it is, whether it's building a railway, building, uh, running the Olympic Games or anything of that sort, are almost ine inevitably and invariably estimated in advance much lower than they turn out to be. Not always, but almost always. And this is a phenomenon known as appraisal optimism, uh, that indeed in order to get projects done, uh, people tend to take very optimistic views of the costs. 
We also looked at some of the ethical implications. It was very interesting that particularly in the time we were writing the Royal Society report, uh, there was much concern that doing this kind of global geoengineering might raise unprecedented new ethical considerations that needed to be taken into account. Interestingly enough, in the course of this research, as we looked into it uh, deeper, and we had a couple of moral philosophers working directly on the project, it became clear that actually it doesn't raise entirely novel issues. It just raises issues on a larger scale that already exist. Problems of consent, for example. Uh, so we already have in climate change the problem of who has consented to the form of industrial development that has led to the problem. With geoengineering, we'd have problems of consent you know, to, for example, sulfate aerosol technology. Uh, could that consent be granted by national governments? Would you need some kind of wider consent from populations to do that? Could a small number of governments uh, get together and implement this technology? Um, and on the argument that if nobody else actually actively objects or obstructs it, that they have given implicit consent. So there's those kinds of issues uh, that already uh, exist for other aspects of climate change. Uh, trust and liability arrangements also figured very largely in this kind of work. Who pays if something goes badly wrong? We also noted that ethical issues are predominantly based on Western perspectives, particularly the idea of the, uh, uh, the individual that we have developed in Western society in the period since the Enlightenment, uh, and that one might have a very different set of arguments around geoengineering if you were to actually start from, say, a Confucian perspective, where you have the model of the family as the model of the collectivity, and it's the collectivity that is sovereign, not the individual. We explored global security implications. A number of people, particularly Jim Fleming, the American historian, uh, has expressed very serious concerns that these kinds of technologies or some of these technologies might be weaponized, particularly the solar radiation management. Uh, our analysis suggested that actually weaponization is unlikely for a number of reasons. One is it would violate international law. There is something called the Environmental Modification Treaty uh, that was uh, signed by most of the countries in the world in the aftermath of the Vietnam War, outlawing environmental warfare. It's not a particularly vigorous regime, uh, but there are also practical reasons why weaponization is unlikely. Essentially, you would only use these things to do two things. One is terrain denial to the enemy. In other words, you make it rain a lot and so their tanks get bogged down or something of that sort. Or uh, you would actually try to intervene in the weather in order to harm civilian morale. Um, it has to be said that these are very unpredictable technologies. They're very hard to control. Uh, and there are much easier ways uh, to achieve either terrain denial or uh, damaging civilian morale than would be to use these climate intervention technologies uh, as weapons. But that doesn't mean to say there are no security implications at all. There is the indirect threat of perceived cross-border impacts. If you imagine for a moment that India had been experimenting with sulfate aerosols, what was it, five or six years ago, just before the big floods in Pakistan, I think it's not hard to understand that it would be very difficult to persuade any Pakistani politician or any Pakistani in the street uh, that the Indians were not somehow or other responsible for the catastrophic floods uh, that had ensued. So the perception that either experimentation with this technology or even implementation of the technology could have negative effects uh, across national borders is enough to represent a significant security concern. It's also inevitable uh, that the defense establishment, um, the military-industrial complex, as Eisenhower referred to it, uh, would have a role in solar radiation management. In the, in the West, it would be likely to be the involvement of firms like British Aerospace and so on, who have the technologies that would be involved in getting stuff up into the stratosphere. Uh, and in China, it would probably be the People's Liberation Army, which already actually operates a large network of weather modification uh, technologies in the People's Republic of China. So we can see that there are concerns here that people would, might well have that uh, of the association of these technologies 
with the defense establishment for those reasons. There's also a risk of counter-geoengineering if you think for a moment that there are some countries who feel that they're benefiting from a higher temperature and they see efforts to keep global temperatures down, uh, they might well engage in activities designed to increase the greenhouse gases to compensate for the reduction. Uh, and then you would have, a, in a sense, a global geoengineering arms race. Uh, it's not entirely implausible. We have, we're facing something uh, which we've described as the geoengineering paradox, or my philosophical friends uh, tell me I should call it the geoengineering dilemma, which is that the technically easiest and most fast-acting technology, which is probably the solar radiation management using sulfate aerosols, would probably be the most difficult to govern. Those of you who attended my lecture last week uh, will, uh, will know for sure uh, that I am deeply skeptical of the need to have big international treaties to do most of the sensible things that we need to do to deal with climate change. The one thing I think you would absolutely need to have a global uh, universal treaty before you were able to do it is sulfate aerosol uh, in the atmosphere because of those perceived concerns, that, uh, security concerns that I've just described. So what's technically like to be fast acting would possibly in project terms be relatively cheap and would be relatively simple uh, to bring to fruition is probably a distant socio-political prospect. On the other hand, the carbon capture uh, technologies that Richard described are probably quite easy to govern. They probably fall already under existing national laws for environmental uh, assessment, environmental protection, uh, and planning laws. Uh, you wouldn't therefore need an international treaty to implement them. Uh, particularly if your storage facilities didn't cross national boundaries uh, and were contained completely within your own borders. Um, but on the other hand, as Richard has already pointed out, you're reverse engineering the entire fossil fuel industry for about 200 years, and actually probably the cement and agro industry in terms of the scale of what you have to put together. So to bring any of those technologies to the point where you've got enough of it going on, to make a significant difference to the atmosphere is going to be several decades, and then you're going to wait several more decades before the carbon reductions that you achieve through the technology work through the climate system to actually affect temperatures. So one might be inclined to skepticism about the idea that either of these kinds of technologies are actually going to be uh, of much use to us. But at this point, I think it's too early to simply throw them out. International law, we looked at the international legal situation. I've already mentioned domestic uh, regulation. Uh, we know that there is tension here between uh, different commentators about whether you need a top-down anticipatory regulatory system or a bottom-up emergent approach. Uh, the Convention on Biodiversity has shown some appetite to try to uh, assert its overall jurisdiction across the field as a whole. But there's a question as whether, in fact, it is either necessary or is it even plausible when you're dealing what, with what I've described as these socio-technical imaginaries to fully articulate a comprehensive ar architecture before you've even done the research to tell you what the technologies really are. And there are those who say, question whether we should even be researching in this area. So at the top here, you see a colleague, Mike Hulme uh, of King's College London. He argues that the, uh, the kinds of climate models we use to explore the potential impacts of these technologies are, quote, mere calculative cartoons. We could never know enough to implement these technologies with any level of responsible certainty about how they were going to perform. And his view is that, in fact, this ignorance, this inevitable ignorance, will save us from the folly of engaging in uh, climate geoengineering, particularly the sulfate aerosols. A diametrically opposite view is expressed by David Keith, uh, who Richard has already referred to, uh, and uh, David uh, points out that we have, in fact, got quite a lot of empirical information from the behavior of volcanoes and so on. Uh, we've got bits of engineering uh, that we know how to do, uh, and that a carefully staged incremental research program gradually ramping up uh, would give us a better idea of whether or not any of these technologies really have something uh, to offer. And in contrast with the idea that ignorance saves us from folly, David Keith argues it's folly to remain ignorant of our ignorance. 
There are those who say, but we should, still shouldn't do research because of a slippery slope, that somehow even thinking about these technologies uh, is to encourage people to think about what should be unthinkable. Uh, there are those who talk about, the, the, have this idea that somehow or other there is an inevitable trajectory from even doing the front end of research to implementation. There are those people who argue humankind has never invented a technology it hasn't used. These people have obviously ne never set foot in a patent office uh, because patent offices are actually the graveyards of dreams and most patents are in fact death certificates. There is a phenomenon known in the... Uh, um, in the technology innovation field as the valley of death, uh, which says that you have major problems very usually going from invention through to the level of research and development that actually leads to deployment of technology. And in this case, we can actually uh, look to the, uh, the fast breeder reactor program where the world spent, uh, I forget exactly how many billions of dollars on research into fast breeder reactors uh, in the... Uh, 1990s around that period, well, really, it's sort of, uh, for about over 20 or 30 decades around the 90s, and of course, we don't have any fast breeder reactors operating anywhere in the world today. So that's probably not actually a compelling argument, although it is one that's often invoked. I talked about dilemmas of control for research. There are obviously questions. Uh, who should govern or regulate? Should it be international bodies? Do you need an international treaty before you start the research? Uh, do national governments regulate? Can scientists actually self-regulate uh, the research process? Um, how do we distinguish geoengineering research from basic science? If somebody conducts an experiment whereby they're putting um, saltwater particles into the atmosphere to explore the science of cloud formation, as we've heard uh, Richard describe one of the techniques, is that a geoengineering technique only if that's the intention is to develop a geoengineering technology from that. And it's not a geoengineering technique if you're just doing it to understand the basic science. So there are real problems here about how do you define the object of your regulatory framework um, when, uh, if you're relying entirely on intention. And distinguishing research from implementation, uh, it is argued that the solar radiation management technologies, particularly the sulfate aerosols, can actually only be fully tested at large scale whether or not that's true, it's certainly the case that it is a very fuzzy boundary to, between any kind of large-scale experimentation uh, and uh, implementation. So we have real dilemmas here in facing uh, any kind of attempt to design a framework under which research could be responsibly conducted. And for that reason, uh, colleagues here from Oxford, along with um, uh, Nick Pigeon from uh, the University of Cardiff, uh, and at the time, Catherine Regwell, who was at UCL, but is now the Chichley Professor uh, of uh, International Public Law here at Oxford, uh, proposed to the House of Commons Science and Technology Committee what we called the Oxford Principles for Geoengineering Governance. And we proposed these in 2010. Uh, we said engineering should be regulated as a public good and in the public interest. Uh, that it was important to have public participation in decision-making about geoengineering, uh, that, that, that decision-making should be at the appropriate scale for the scale of the geoengineering activity, whether it's a localized experiment, a larger project, or uh, international implementation. That, in fact, in the research process, it was very important that we had full disclosure of uh, and open publication of results. Uh, we were concerned here about the model of the pharmaceutical industry, which has a notorious reputation reputation for not publishing results of drug trials that are uh, not helpful to the development and marketing of their medicines. And we certainly wouldn't want anything like that to happen in terms of the development of these technologies. That there should be independent assessment of the technologies, whether this could be done by a NASA red, red team, blue team type technique uh, or other techniques. We're quite open on that, but the notion that there should be independent assessment, not just the scientist's own self-assessment of what it is that they're doing. Uh, and that we needed to have governance arrangements that are clear at each stage as we move from implementation to development, to, through development to deployment. And these principles were, in fact, accepted by the House of Commons Science and Technology Committee, Committee in their recommendations to government and subsequently were accepted by the British government. But they were subject to criticism. There was a uh, critical paper in Nature, for example, that said these are far too general. They could apply to any controversial emerging technology.
And my response to that is, well, why not? But of course, we do have to deal with the issue of specificity. And we have to particularly to deal, with, deal with the fact that we are dealing with this very heterogeneous range of technical practices, and we're dealing with something which is at a very early stage of development, and we don't know how it's going to pan out, so we can't anticipate how, what regulations we may need two or three stages down the line of research. So what we propose is the uh, development of what we call technology-specific research protocols that would be put in place um, at each stage of research, uh, maybe this is when, in fact, a grant application is being made or when a program or project is being proposed in a, uh, a lab or a university, um, and that the research protocol would be designed to demonstrate how one has taken the Oxford principles and is putting them into practice in that stage of the research. And then you would have a stage gate at the end of that stage where you would be required to demonstrate how, in fact, you have done that in the first stage, and before going on to the next stage of research, how you propose to take those principles into account in the ensuing stage of research. Also, you may well find that the body which then has to approve the next stage changes as the scale of the research increases from doing computerized modeling inside a lab, doing large scale, larger laboratory-based experiments, doing outdoor experiments, but still basically in research facilities, to doing ambient uh, uh, environmental experiments or even some kind of regional implementation. So it's, a, it's an architecture that's highly flexible uh, and can evolve alongside the technologies themselves, staying just one jump ahead, uh, hopefully, at each stage. And we would argue that this model has already uh, shown its uh, merits in something called the SPICE balloon experiment. SPICE was a project on geoengineering, um, which stands for Stratospheric Particle Injection for Climate Engineering. There we are, I got it. Um, and basically, this was largely an engineering project, uh, one of the parts of which was the idea to put a balloon uh, up into the air. Uh, only on only one kilometer high, a relatively small balloon with a hose pipe attached to spray water out the end, to investigate some of the engineering issues that would be involved in building a much larger balloon the size of Wembley Stadium on a 23 or 26 kilometer tether spraying sulfate aerosols as a, as a delivery system. Uh, this was a uh, proposal which the research councils uh, required be stage gated and uh, required that the proposers demonstrate, among other things, how they consulted the local communities on the Cambridgeshire airfield where this experiment was going to be conducted. And it's often misreported that this experiment was cancelled because of public objections to the experiment. That's not the case. In fact, the experiment was cancelled, but it was cancelled because it became clear that some of the uh, participants in the experiment had already, prior to making the proposal, taken out patents, giving themselves intellectual property rights in the uh, products that they were, uh, in, the, in the technology that they were exploring. And this was seen to be in violation uh, of the kinds of principles that we had advocated, particularly the project uh, principle investigator in vote principle one, the public interest uh, and public good, uh, recognizing that the public engagement, although not decisive, had been inadequate and the absence of explicit governance arrangements. So we've seen that uh, actually, in this case, the principles were able to, to function as a governance mechanism quite effectively at the level of self-governance of scientists at the very early stages of experimentation. I'm not going to dwell on this slide. I'm just going to uh, put it up here to note that we have been engaging uh, in attempts to stimulate a broader dialogue internationally and beyond the scientific and technical uh, community as part of the project. I'll leave you with two final questions we asked ourselves. The first question was, what can geoengineering do for the climate? That's the conventional question uh, that's asked, and we suggest that, uh, in fact, uh, that's still, the jury is still out on this, but we are largely in favor of continuing, continuing research to try to get a better handle on whether uh, these technologies have something to offer. We are concerned that it's questionable whether uh, that we can scale up the CDR technologies in time to have much uh, beneficial effect for our climate strategies, uh, 
uh, that while solar radiation management promises a fast impact, uh, it presents significant physical and political risks. And in fact, if you want to save lives and property this century without geoengineering, actually, you've got to put a lot more emphasis on adaptation uh, than we currently do. So Richard would like to pursue more mitigation in order to reduce the emissions, uh, but recognizing that even if we reduce our emissions, again, we still have a multi-decadal delay before they make an effect. Finally, though, here's the social scientist's little twist on this. We also want to ask what can geoengineering do for society or protect perhaps what can geoengineering discourses uh, do for society more accurately. One of the things to say here is that the values are unusually explicit right up front. The different values that people bring to arguments about emerging science and technology don't usually emerge until, as was the case with nanotechnology, as was the case with GM foods, you've already got the technology in place, largely in place. And then those values tend to be concealed behind scientific-type arguments that aren't really arguments about science at all, but are arguments about values. And so this is a really interesting case whereby we're bringing those values out up front. And it provides opportunities to uh, explore the kinds of representations that we make about nature and society and the relationship between them uh, that are usually left implicit and concealed in controversies about uh, technology. And then finally, what can geoengineering teach us about the governance of other global emerging technologies to which we might want to apply a similar framework to that described in the Oxford Principles? Thank you. Thank you very much to both uh, Steve and Richard. I'm going to invite Richard back up onto the stage, and we have um, time for questions now. We have a roving mic, so please wait for the microphone to get to you. I should also just warn you that this is being uh, filmed um, and webcast, so if you don't want to be part of that film, um, please don't ask a question. <laughs> okay? Um, can I have a show of hands? Any, any questions? Please. There's one here. Uh, so, should we? Short question, should we do this, in your opinions? Um, well, <laughs> yeah, you've asked for a, for, for a short answer. We shouldn't get ourselves into a position where we need to do it. It's, it's kind of a Weasley answer. We don't actually need to do it at the moment. We, there is still time to take the right course of action to avoid needing to do this. What we certainly should do, in my view, and, and the OGP is signed up to this, is investigate more. So we don't, you know, the Oxford Geoengineering Programme does not subscribe to the idea that we're protected by our ignorance. I, this personally makes me feel personally extremely uncomfortable as a general proposition. I mean, what does that really mean? Does that mean I shouldn't be up here talking to you tonight because it's better that you're ignorant than that I should try and explain some of these issues or <coughs> Steve explain the dilemmas? Should we simply not talk about geoengineering at all? Pretend it's not there because it's a taboo subject? So I, th I think we need to investigate what it means on the sociology, on the politics, on the finance and all these other questions. On the technology, sure, we need to know whether it's even feasible. Steve's explained that it's a technological imaginary. It could be that there are actually no technologies that we would ever want to apply, in which case that has certainly some significance for the way climate change negotiations and our viewing of the whole climate change thing should develop. So I would like to answer your question by saying I would avoid getting into the state where we have to do this, if at all possible. I would say certainly we should avoid any premature moves or rushes to implement any technology along these lines or anything that resembles them. Uh, but I think we should be doing the research into understanding better uh, what they, they might offer us and what the, their implications, positive and negative, might be. And if that research only tells us that, in fact, they're all rubbish and we shouldn't be thinking about any of them, at least we would be making that judgment from an informed point of view. We could get them off the table, 
and then they would no longer be something that people might be referring to uh, in the way that we find certain US politicians like Newt Gingrich referring to them as, uh, you know, well, this, this is how we will deal with the problem if it turns out to be real. Uh, so I, th I think, uh, I know it's a classic answer for academics to say more research is needed, uh, but in this case, I would say more research is needed. The Royal Society recommended five million pounds a year for, for ten, years. 10 years. That's peanuts. What has actually been spent in the last five years is five million pounds. Okay, so if in five years we've spent what the Royal Society recommended we should be spending each year for 10 years. So we're nowhere near uh, a level of uh, exploration of these technologies that can actually inform us as to whether they are viable or desirable or undesirable and unviable. Any more questions? Here at the front. Hi, thanks for your talk, and I've learned a lot from uh, what the uh, current state of uh, geoengineering is. I am a meteorologist, and I know how difficult it is to predict the weather. So if one day we start seeding the cloud or fertilizing the ocean, you become even more difficult. We have uh, difficulty predicting the weather in 10 days, and I know how the weather will change, how the atmosphere will change uh, after we start doing that. So um, there's also an a ethical problem or moral problem if uh, we once we start doing, doing this, the uh, atmosphere is changed and, for example, a uh, tropical cyclone is generated that kills thousands of people, or perceived, or is perceived that the uh, tropical cyclone is caused by the cloud seeding process. So it will pose a very difficult questions to the policymakers and the uh, scientists at the time. Uh, there's an also a question that would it present a false hope to the general public that we can just sit and wait for the uh, geoengineering technology to mature, uh, so the climate change problem will go, uh, will, 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 no longer be, uh, will no longer exist, and then we can just wait and do nothing right now and continue our uh, expensive, uh, extravagant lifestyle without changing anything. So what's your opinion to us uh, for these two questions? I would say that that view has been expressed, and there is concern that uh, people have had about what's the so-called moral hazard effect which is the idea that if you hold out the prospect that there is a, uh, a cheap and easy solution to climate change, that people will try less hard at emissions reduction. I'd point out that, in fact, from the 1980s through to around 2010, the same argument was made about adaptation. We shouldn't talk about adaptation, because if we hold out the prospect we can adapt to climate change, people won't try so hard uh, at emissions reduction. It's a bit like talking to American Southern Baptists about sex education in schools. They think it's not a good idea because it encourages the kids to, get to, to do bad things. Um, the social science research on this is, remains ambiguous. There have been some studies that show uh, that there is a moral hazard effect among the public, not just with Newt Gingrich. Uh, there are other studies which indicates that, in fact, you have a negative moral hazard effect, uh, that, in fact, in some, at least one study, that self-identified climate skeptics said they would be more inclined to do emissions reduction if they saw firms and governments actually spending money on geoengineering, because they would be more inclined to believe that there was a real problem, which they don't believe at the moment, because they look around and say it's all hot air and people expressing concern and all the rest of it, but nobody's actually doing anything, so it's not real. So at the moment, the, tr the, the fact is we don't really know, and that's another reason why we want to do more social science research as well as more engineering uh, and technical research as this f field develops, or should it develop. In, in your question, you, you mentioned one thing, which was the idea that we should kind of sit and wait for geoengineering technology to develop, to mature. I think that's a dangerous thing for all of us to do. I'm, I'm, I know you weren't suggesting we should, but you, you mentioned it as a, a one thing that might happen. And in fact, it is what's happening at the moment, mainly. And that, is, that has given a rather strange uh, flavor to the whole of geoengineering. It remains a technological imaginary, apart from a couple of groups 
uh, in the States who are developing what they thought and perhaps still think could be commercial processes for extracting CO2 out of the atmosphere. So the, the David Keith's idea, David has a company which he's using to develop the technology. And that, that's, that's fine to develop the technology and, and see how it might work. Um, but it does mean that some quite interesting areas which in the sense of climate engineering might be attractive and interesting are getting very little support. I mean, late, uh, Stephen Salter's uh, cloud brightening, it, it has quite a few problems, but it's also quite promising and, and quite kind of interesting. And it would be something which I think we would all need like to know a lot more about, but you know who's going to put money into that? So I think in the whole area of climate, this is an area of climate science really. I mean, we wouldn't treat climate science in this way of saying, oh well, we're not going to have government funded research measuring all sorts of climatology because, well, we'll just wait and see who measures what and, and, and see what turns up. I think it's a risky approach. I think we should have a much more intelligent debate about, and, and an international debate about what we really need to do to understand this, this whole technology, and not just the technology, but also, as Steve has said, the you know, political and ethical. So we shouldn't just be sitting back and wait, but yeah. Just emphasize, by the way, that I don't know anybody who's seriously engaged in this field who believes that geoengineering is in any way an alternative to emissions reductions. At best, it's a supplement. There's a question here. Keep going. Um, thanks, both of you, for very insightful presentations. I remember, and I was trying to figure out the year, but it's lost in, in the memory, but I remember distinctly the hubris when we worked on the social cost of carbon in the IEA's first program on uh, carbon capture and storage, that anyone would think this is useful that was 20 years ago, at least. And it's like, well, it's still there. It's still, and it's now on the table as a serious uh, issue. But what, what I was struck about in the thinking uh, through what I don't know, because I haven't followed this in, in any serious way, is there are a lot of parallels to the negotiations on loss and damage that are the dominant and largely, I think, uncontested move to get adaptation into a global framework that's far more oriented toward liability than voluntary action. But some of the same issues about the evaluation of damages depend on your assumptions, the understanding of the climate science to unpack complex processes, the difference between a causal chain that might be simple or complicated versus complex or chaotic. I just wondered whether you'd sort of spilled over into that area. Uh, I think you can justifiably draw those parallels, but at the moment I would say that geoengineering is making zero impact on any negotiations process. It's just not on the agenda. <laughs> Going back to... Um, some of the issues you described with um, kind of carbon extraction from the air using sodium solutions. Has, an, has there been any large scale investigation into alternative extraction methods such as uh, there was uh, a method implemented in the States to use essentially solar furnaces um, to take, to produce synthetic hydrocarbons from carbon dioxide out of the air hydrogen from water using basically focused sunlight, which would eliminate your need for large quantities of sodium compounds, which would then eliminate your need to have to burn a large amount of fossil fuels in order to regenerate that in your unfavorable thermodynamic cycle. Yeah, that's a good question. There are a, a, a quite a number of other processes that you could think about, and some of them have had some work done on them. Uh, I mentioned David Keith's idea with the caustic soda because that is, I think, the furthest uh, developed and, and David has also been quite active in the geoengineering community in you know, talking about the ethics of the, the whole issue. So his technology 
and, and Steve showed it at the end, that big bank of absorbers on the left-hand side, that was Keith's absorption uh, technology or part of it. Uh, yes, so solar concentrators which can uh, carry out reactions, for example, to produce hydrogen as a fuel, so you're turning sunlight directly into hydrogen. It's a, that's an interesting process. It's a slight problem with scale up there, so to produce the amounts of hydrogen you would need to make any sort of dent in the hydrocarbon industry would, would involve a lot of plant. That's, but we're talking about a big industry, so that's an interesting technology which various places around the world, I think Australia in particular, I think has done quite a lot of work on that. And there's been work in Europe as well, I think there? there's, a, there's a solar concentrator somewhere up a Swiss mountain, I believe. Um, there are other types of absorption process. Uh, some of you may have heard of Klaus Lackner, who's an... Uh, uh, at Arizona State, I was visiting about two weeks ago, has developed some quite interesting adsorbents, which will take CO2 out of the atmosphere, and he's got some ideas about how you could combine that, integrate it with other types of technology to make a, a worthwhile process. So there is some work going on, and there, are, uh, there is certainly room here for a lot of creativity. So there's a, there's a big kind of technology need, and there's, there's a hole there for people to think of, of, of new ways of doing things, indeed. You're right about the thermodynamics, by the way. It's very difficult to think your way around the thermodynamic problem of extracting CO2 out of the atmosphere. It's so thermodynamically uh, disadvantageous. You need to be really quite clever to get around that. And I'm not sure that anybody's quite solved it yet. I think there's a question over here by the window. Daniel Scharf, um, shouldn't some or all of the Oxford principles apply to burning any more fossil fuels, given that that seems to have engineered 6% of our carbon emissions? And have we not emitted sulphur um, into the atmosphere that is actually reducing the temperature, or has that not happened at scale yet? Do you want to take that one? Well, I do, to address the last one first, yes, I'm afraid that our sulfur cleanup of power station exhaust and auto exhaust and seagoing vessel exhaust has made the atmosphere purer for us but has been not so good for global warming and it's thought to have added an appreciable i don't know do you know the figure but it's a certainly a significant fraction of a degree to the rise in temperature so you know this is a an indication that you know the importance of balancing up pros and cons so you know, we lead a slightly healthier lives our, ourselves by taking the sulfur out. So we can just hope for a few volcanic eruptions. That'll bring the temperature back down again. Well, sorry, what, what was the other? Oh, applying it to, yeah. <laughs> I would take that as a rhetorical question. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's rather neat, isn't it? Um, I don't know if any of you read uh, Christopher Booker in the, in the Telegraph. I enjoy reading him because it always makes my blood pressure go up. I think that must be good for me. It's, it's at least equivalent to running a mile or two. Um, but he was going on recently about uh, how ridiculous it was. It had been suggested that the fossil fuel industry was enjoying a subsidy because the, their waste product is thrown into the atmosphere with no, re no consideration for what we would term the externalities. And he wouldn't recognise that. Um, the fact is that we're all allowed to burn fossil fuel to the detriment of the climate and, and just let the CO2 go. If we had to pay for the damage that was causing, uh, which sooner or later, we or our children or our children's children or somebody is going to have to pay for, we might be a little less keen about burning the stuff, but, well, I think you know what the political realities are at the moment. Do we have any other questions? There's one more question, and then I... We have to conclude. Thank you very much. Um, you were talking about the concrete industry as one of the main uh, culprits for producing CO2. Um, recently, in the, uh, in the insulation industry, they've been using hydrogen in thermal blocks 
uh, as I liked, it, uh, the very efficient uh, way of um, creating insulation. Is there any way that you could use the spare CO2 in a similar way to that hydrogen? I don't know. I mean, you can, you can uh, compress hydrogen. It's not going to go into a liquid form, is it? Mm. In re replace that. It's just getting it forms small bubbles in the uh, in the concrete mm. itself to create extremely light blocks, which are in extremely um, thermal efficient. I mean, uh, <laughs> keeping out um, as an insulator. Sorry, the hydrogen is a good insulator. Well, carbon dioxide, of course, is much heavier, so the blocks wouldn't be so light. Okay. The, the problem the problem with finding anything to do with hydrogen, uh, excuse carbon me, dioxide. with carbon okay. dioxide is the amounts that we have to deal with. Because the largest chemical, you know, the largest productions of chemicals, of any sort of chemicals, are about 50 million tons a year. Well, we are producing about 4 billion tons a year of, uh, uh, of oil. And if you add the gas and the coal on top of that, the amount of carbon we're processing totally outweighs the entire chemical industry, the entire materials industry, including cement, and just about everything, the only thing that comes anywhere like it is the entire mining industry, if you add up all the aluminium, all the iron, all the everything. I mean, there is just nowhere we can put that carbon. And we can use little bits of it in, for example, insulating material or growing tomatoes in greenhouses and so on. But we're still left, if we go in for carbon dioxide extraction from flue gas, for example, We'll have a huge amount of CO2 that you just can't do anything with except put down a hole in the ground. There will be no other okay. destination. Th thanks, Richard. I, we're going to have to uh, draw to a I'm close afraid. there. Um, but before we thank our speakers again, I just want to draw your attention to a few things coming up here at the school. Uh, you may or may not be aware that this is part of a series of lectures we have uh, every Thursday on climate change. It's been going since January, <laughs> to give you an idea of the multifaceted nature of this issue. We have two more uh, lectures in the series. Next week, um, we are hearing from Professors David Bannister and Malcolm McCulloch on sustainable transport, electric dreams versus carbon reality. Um, and then concluding the whole seminar, we have Professor uh, Cameron Hepburn, who is going to be talking from an economics perspective, a, a wealthy, healthy planet creating green economic growth. Um, and then just two other events to draw your um, attention to. Um, on Monday, we have Connie Hedegaard coming to talk um, here at 5 p.m. Uh, Connie Hedegaard was the um, host minister at the COP in Copenhagen. Um, she then spent about five years as the EU commissioner um, on climate action. Um, and she's coming here in the run-up all these lectures are to the Paris COP at the end of this year um, to give us a personal perspective on what it's like actually to be in the heart of those negotiations. Um, she doesn't have a portfolio now, so she, we hope she'll be speaking um, to us a bit, just what it's really like in those meetings. So I think that'll be a very interesting um, evening for any of you who can make that at 5 p.m. here. Um, and then just to remind you that the Oxford Martin School covers all of these areas around climate, but many others beside. Um, on the 27th of May, we have um, an evening with um, Chris Woods, and the investigative journalist who's um, going to be talking about his uh, new book on sudden justice. That's about America's secret drone wars, and that's hosted by another Martin School program on human rights. So um, do also come along to that if you're interested, 27th of May, and consult our website because we have many other lectures um, going on all the time. So. I'd like to just close with one final round of applause for our speakers. Thank you. Thank you.